In the seventh episode of Star Trek Picard, the characters split up as Elnor remains on the Borg artifact. Picard and Soji go visit old friends, and the rest of the La Sirena crew heads after him. Here are all the Easter eggs and references you might have missed in Nepenthe. When Picard and Soji are confronted in the woods at Nepenthe by Will Riker and Deanna Troy's daughter Kestra, she points her bow and arrow at Picard's heart. But he tells her she may want to aim at his head instead, since his heart is made of solid duritanium. Picard's artificial heart was first established as canon in the second season episode Samaritan Snare, in which Picard has to undergo an operation to replace the deteriorating mechanical organ. Picard says his original heart replacement occurred after being stabbed through the back by a group of Nausicans when he was younger, which he tells Wesley was a curious sensation. Not much pain. Shock, certainly, at the sight of uh, serrated metal sticking through my chest. Later in the sixth episode, Tapestry, we actually see this confrontation play out thanks to some time meddling from Q. When Picard visits Will Riker and Deanna Troy, we learn that the couple has had two children in the time that has passed since Star Trek Nemesis. Their first, a boy named Thad, would have been 18 in 2399, but tragically passed away several years earlier. At the time of Nepenthe, they have only one surviving child, a precocious teen with a vivid imagination named Kestra. Both of the Troy Riker children were actually named for members of their parents' families. As revealed in the Voyager episode Death Wish, Thaddeus Riker was a soldier in the Union Army during the American Civil War whose life was saved by a Q named Quinn. That is Colonel Thaddeus Riker. After he was wounded at Pine Mountain, they used to call him Old Iron Boots. But while Thad Troy Riker was named for a distant ancestor of his father, Kestra got her name from a much closer relation to her mother. As revealed in the Next Generation episode Dark Page, Kestra Troy was Deanna's older sister, who died as a child in a tragic accident. Deanna didn't know about Kestra until she was an adult, when she helped her mother finally work through her decades-old grief and guilt over Kestra's death. In Riker's first scene in Picard, he's working in the kitchen, preparing ingredients for homemade pizza while listening to jazz. Both of these pastimes are things Picard's erstwhile number one often enjoyed in between shifts on the Enterprise. In the Next Generation Season 2 episode Time Squared, Riker makes scrambled eggs from scratch for his fellow crewmates, using Owen eggs he picked up at their last stop at Starbase 73. Unfortunately, it turns out that Owen eggs aren't appetizing to humans, and most of Riker's guests can't manage more than a mouthful. In his defense, Riker says, A cook is only as good as his ingredients. In Nepenthe, Riker seems to have learned his lesson, using tomatoes and basil from his own garden in his pizza. Meanwhile, Will Riker's love for jazz was first shown in the Next Generation Season 1 episode 11001001. In that episode, an alien species called the Biners distracts Riker by keeping him on the holodeck, where he plays trombone with a 1958 New Orleans jazz combo. After learning that Soji is a synthetic modeled after Commander Data, Kestra begins quizzing her new acquaintance on her interests and abilities. Do you play the violin? No. Do you like Sherlock Holmes? I guess so. Data first picked up the violin in order to get into character as Sherlock Holmes in the Next Generation Season 2 episode Elementary Dear Data. In the episode, Data and Geordi are confronted with a hologram of Holmes's arch-nemesis Moriarty, who begins to gain sentience. The themes of Elementary Dear Data about artificial intelligence which becomes self-aware are very similar to those of Picard. Kestra also asks whether Soji has any enhanced physical abilities, like bending metal with her bare hands. On The Next Generation, this was one of the demonstrations that Riker himself uses to argue against Data's humanity in the episode The Measure of a Man. Fortunately, despite Riker presenting a strong case on behalf of Bruce Maddox, the judge rules in Data and Picard's favor. It is the ruling of this court that Lieutenant Commander Data has the freedom to choose. Riker later apologizes to Data for arguing that he wasn't a person, but Data immediately absolves him, telling him that if he hadn't done it, Data would never have been given the opportunity to defend himself in the first place. After quizzing Soji on whether she inherited any of her interests and abilities from her father, Data, Kestra moves on to her biological functions, wondering if her synthetic body produces things like saliva and mucus. When Soji confirms that it does, Kestra muses that it would make sense that Data's synthetic offspring would have so many of these biological traits, since he was always trying to be more human. She goes on to explain that despite all of Data's impressive android abilities, all he ever really wanted to do were things like have dreams, tell jokes, and learn how to ballroom dance. Data was featured doing all three of these activities during various episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Data first started experiencing dreams in the sixth season episode Birthright Part 1. After that episode, he said that he planned to incorporate dreaming into his regular routine. He also repeatedly tried to tell jokes throughout The Next Generation's run, and even received lessons in humor from a holographic stand-up comedian in the Season 2 episode The Outrageous Okana. I 
come from a town so small, we had a fraction for a zip code. <laughs> And he hilariously asks for dancing lessons from Dr. Crusher in the Season 4 episode Data's Day, which also features the return of Bruce Maddox. Due to a miscommunication, Crusher teaches Data to tap dance, when what he really needed to learn was ballroom dancing for an upcoming wedding. While attempting to persuade Rios and Rafi to abandon Picard and return to Earth, Agnes said she'd hope to be the fun crew member who says things like, Let's hide in that comet, and it turns out to be a giant gormagander or something. Gormaganders resemble giant space whales and were first seen in the Star Trek Discovery episode Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad, in which a character hid inside an injured gormagander in an attempt to smuggle himself on board the Discovery and take over the ship. But of course, hiding in a comet that turns out to be a giant organic life form is also a clear reference to that other hugely popular space saga. In The Empire Strikes Back, Han Solo hides from the Imperial Navy by piloting the Millennium Falcon into a cave in an asteroid, which turns out to actually be the mouth of a giant space slug. When trying to convince the adults around the dinner table that her friend Captain Crandall would be the ideal candidate to transport Picard and Soji off-world on a ship, Kestra brags about Crandall's travel, saying, He's been everywhere from Kronos to Tykin's Rift. Kronos has been mentioned many times throughout Star Trek history as the home of the Klingon Empire, and Picard and his crew have even visited it a few times. Meanwhile, Tykin's Rift isn't a planet, but rather a type of spatial anomaly that absorbs all the surrounding energy. The Enterprise became trapped in a Tykin's Rift in the Next Generation Season 4 episode Night Terrors. In that episode, Counselor Troy was the one who worked out the solution so that the Enterprise could finally break free of the Rift. Years later, we see that Picard is still seeking advice from Troy to get himself out of seemingly impossible situations, and that she is more than willing to give it. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about Star Trek are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.